So good morning, everyone, and welcome to a number of so many of these Friday mornings, and thank you all for encouraging us to continue them. Uh, just in case there's anyone new online, I'm Judy Trotter, head of adult education at JW3, and it's a uh, such a privilege to welcome back Professor Ellie Vakil. Um, Ellie joined us at the end of October, and I was just listening to the beginning of that session and how raw we all felt. I'm not sure we don't all feel raw now, but it is. we are definitely in a, a different place and yet still not a good place. So Ellie, really grateful for, uh, for you joining us. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, Professor Vakil is the Professor Emeritus at the, and the former Departmental Chairman in the Department of Psychology, and he's the Director of the Rehabilitation Centre for Veterans after Traumatic Brain Injury in Jaffa, both of which, of course, are very, very relevant to the kind of discussions we've been having on a Friday morning. Uh, Ellie's very happy to take questions, and um, we can even put these during the session so please put them in the chat for me so i can uh, choose the right place to ask them or do them at the end so as before ellie this is not an easy task what would you like to share with us today and over to you uh, good morning everyone good morning judy and thank you for inviting me it's always a pleasure to be with you and uh, i i think it's very important um that you are interested in the listening to what uh, uh, an Israeli has to say these days. So I would like to share with you today my thoughts, primarily as an Israeli citizen, but also as a psychologist and uh, also as a memory expert. Well, five months ago, we experienced a significant trauma as individuals, families, communities, as a nation. And we are now in a kind of a post-traumatic phase. Um, and so I would like to analyze with you the PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder phenomenon, and the long-term consequences of this experience in our memories as individuals and as a nation in a little more depth in order to try and better understand our situation today and its implication on our future. In general, we are in a confusing and unstable situation which does not really help with the healing and the recovery because we are not sure how things will develop. You know, the situation in, the, in our northern border is very fragile these days, and we don't know. We might find ourselves in the midst of a, a war like in hours, in days, in weeks, who knows? So on the one hand, there is a war going on on our borders, but on the other hand, we must return, at least try to return to a kind of, of a routine. Um, so let, let's try to have some insights from uh, the situation and think about the present and the future. Um, memory, like other psychological phenomena, has a survival value. Uh, just as animal, animals remember the source of food and also remember to avoid dangers, basically a post-traumatic reaction had a survival function to burn in our memories the source, the place of danger in order to avoid its prox proximity in the future. Because of the era we are in, the document documentation of the horrific events by videos, photograph, etc., and the and also the fast distribution through the media all over the world, the effect is very strong and amplified. And in order to understand the significance of our situation, I would like to introduce you to um, a model made by uh, Maslow's model of hier hierarchy of needs. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but Abraham Maslow is a very uh, important psychologist from Canada, if I'm not mistaken, that introduced a model. He called it the hierarchy of needs. And let me, let me share it with you because 
I would like to claim that uh, although originally Maslow applied it to individuals, I would like to apply it uh, to people, to a nation. So basically what Maslow claimed is that we have a lot and various needs in our life. However, they must be arranged in a kind of a pyramid, in a kind of a hierarchy. The most basic needs are the physiological needs, such as air, water, food, shelter, etc. Then the layer above it is the safety needs for personal security, etc. Then we can talk about love and belonging. Then we can talk about esteem and respect. And then the top of this pyramid is self-actualization. So what Maslow is saying is there is no way of being or addressing our higher needs before our basic needs are satisfied. Uh, maybe it's important to, to know that the basic needs, actually we share them with with animals, I mean, it's really basic, and uh, and uh, so so when we talk about it, uh, we need to realize that these basic needs of safety and physiological needs are are very basic uh, needs. So I would like to argue that the circumstances caused caused us to regress. To the basic needs of our, to the basic levels of our needs, which are actually the levels, as I said, we and animals share. That is being, in a way, in a survival mode, and I think that that today, uh, as individuals and and as as people, we are in survival mode, and when we are in this in this state, we cannot think about higher needs about self-actualization and about uh, other things. The fear of the long-term consequences of being in this mode is that we will it will affect our capacity for compassion, empathy, which can lead, of course, to xenophobia. I mean, it's a kind, if you wish, of a, a luxury. You know, people, I just attended, I was sharing with Judy that I just attended a conference in New York and and uh, and some of my colleagues and and asked me, what do you feel about the children in Gaza? And I said, I, I feel very sorry for them, but unfortunately, these days I can't afford the luxury of having compassion of people that are trying to kill to kill us. And uh, so my concern is not the fact that now we are in a survival mode. But my concern is, how is it going to affect us as people, as liberal people, for the long run? In the past, as long as the country was in existential danger, the scientific and technological break, break, uh, breakthroughs were, was, were not possible. It only became possible when we felt quite strong and confident. So again, following... Maslow's hierarchy of needs, only when these basic level, levels are addressed, only then you, you can afford addressing the other needs. Although this situation is very different from the Holocaust, it definitely echoes it and thus brings up historical terms. That's why we hear now statements such as never again, that we won't let it happen again. The, concern are, the concerns are now on all the borders, not only in the, southern, in the south, but in the north with Hezbollah and in the center with Palestinians in Judea and Samaria. So we are now uh, very, very concerned. And we definitely mean it when we say never again. So although we are now in the midst of the event and we do not have the sufficient broad perspective, but we already have to think about what will happen, will take with, but we will take, uh, take with us from these events. We, we must, although we are in the middle of things, we must think of the future. 
it should be known that memory is is a reconstruction of what actually was and this is the meaning of creating a narrative there is no such a thing as objective memory that captures reality as it was we have memory biases we we are influenced by uh, by our stereotypes by the context that something that has been studied extensively in the context of uh, the reliability of our witness uh, testimony and the question is why why our brain doesn't function as a computer as a as a as a movie as a video so why why we have these biases why why is it important to have them? And the answer is because it allows our memory to be more flexible and to better adapt. So therefore it is possible to take advantage of these features and already today form a healthier narrative that does not focus solely on the trauma and the negative effects of it, but also on positive aspects that have been discovered in this war. Uh, for example, I, I let me emphasize or demonstrate it in, in two examples. For example, we can talk about the army. We can focus on the failure, the failure of the intelligence, the failure of the Air Force, failure of, uh, I mean, failure of the army protecting in the, and, 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 and the defending the people in the southern border. But, and that would definitely will overshadow everything. But is that what we want to remember for the long run? So I think we, th we should think of how we can maybe shape, help shaping our uh, narrative uh, to make it healthier, at least for the future. So an alternative would be is to emphasize the heroism that civilians, policemen, soldiers showed and exhibited both on October 7th and during the entire war. I mean, it's incredible as many terrible, horrifying uh, movies that we see and videos of the 7th of October, there are just as many, maybe even more stories of really brave people that saved so many lives. So that's if we want to focus on the army. What about the civilians, civil society? We can emphasize, again, the religious versus secular, left versus right disputes that, you know, uh, uh, we uh, went through in the months prior to the war. But we can emphasize also the unity as a mutual mobilization in all circles of society that we have witnessed since October 7th, which is incredible. I'm not talking only about soldiers that fighting next shoulder to shoulder, you know, left and right, religious and, and secular, but even in civilian society, all these uh, volunteering, I mean, across the country. So, what I'm saying is that it's our responsibility as citizens, as leaders, as teachers, as parents, and media to emphasize what unites us and not only what divides us. I mean, we know it. We, we don't want uh, to change the story, but it's a question of what we want to take from these events with us for the future. This way, shaping a healthier narrative that will help us overcome the trauma. What about dealing with the future? Everyone is, I, I was asked at the conference, okay, so what do you, you predict? What's going to happen? Um, I mean, how are we going to overcome this post-traumatic uh, phase that we are all in as individuals, as families, as communities, and in general as nation? So I want to draw upon our uh, knowledge accumulated in the army. I, I served in the army in reserve as a psychologist. Um, well, in routine, I was uh, I was uh, placed to be in uh, army jails and places like that. 
But we are really a psychologist in the army where uh, prepared to deal and handle and help individual soldiers in a, in, in a combat who develop PTSD. So the army uh, invested a lot of effort and, and, and resources to, uh, I mean, that happened on uh, following Yom Kippur War, in which many soldiers were diagnosed as suffering from post-traumatic reaction. So efforts were made to find out who is vulnerable and who may develop, who has the potential of developing PTSD. You can understand that it's very important for the army if you can identify a person, at such a person that potentially would develop PTSD, you don't want to put him uh, as a pilot, even if he has the, the skills to be a pilot, okay? But the interesting finding is that environmental characteristics were found to be better predictors of who would develop PTSD than personality traits. That was quite surprising. Although I must say that today there are some interesting uh, brain studies uh, showing even some biological markers of who has maybe the potential of developing PTSD, uh, which is an interesting uh, field. But what the, the findings of the army which they implement is that they are primarily uh, relevant to our discussion two important variables. The first variable is the cohesion of the unit, of the military unit. In cohesive units where fewer, what was found with there were fewer incidents of PTSD compared to units formed ad hoc, I don't know, if you remember, uh, after I was a soldier in Yom Kippur Wars, I remember, you know, just like this war, uh, Israelis uh, came back and, and were mobilized, you know, ad hoc, they put them together and formed units and sent them to fight. So and apparently the rate of individuals develop PTSD in those units that were formed ad hoc was significantly higher than units that were together um, where, I mean, for years they knew each other and in a way gave them strength and served as a buffer uh, uh, and avoided, at least for some of them, developing PTSD. The second variable, which is, which is also very uh, uh, interesting and maybe expected, is the second predictor was the respect and trust in the commander, in the leader. So the cohesiveness of the, of the unit and uh, trust uh, of the leader were two very important predictors which unit would develop a high rate of individuals of soldiers with PTSD or a lower rate. So these important findings can be applied at the level of a family, that is, as long as the family is united and as much as the parents project confidence, the family members will be better protected uh, from post-traumatic symptoms. The same principles can be applied also at the national level as well. It is not uh, a coincidence that post-trauma uh, in the nation is widespread following this war because this war caught us at one of the, of the points in time when the nation was least united and also a moment where the uh, political leadership was challenged. I mean, some would argue that it's it, not only it's not a coincidence, it actually was the reason that the Hamas attacked us uh, in, in these days. So, from this come the enormous importance in our unification as people. Uh, now we can even say that it's validated by, by uh, studies uh, to look for the common and not for the dividing. And also what would, would greatly help us in dealing with the, uh, with the future is to unite behind the leader that the majority of people respect and trust. I mean, for you as a, 
as uh, English people, the best example for me would be to think of Churchill in the Second World War and the role he played into uh, the strength that he provided to, to the people, to the soldier, to the civilians. This way, hopefully, we can eventually go back and deal with our self-actualization uh, as a nation, I mean, using Maslow's terms, and uh, not stuck in the basement uh, of this pyramid, pyramid of dealing with, with uh, our basic uh, needs of security, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll reach the time will continue to promote our country in all fields, science, medicine, and technology, and really become again the, the startup nation and uh, be able to develop a healthy, uh, liberal uh, society. Thank you. I'll be happy to, to take questions in, in, in a few Thank lines. Thank you, as always. Um, just to go a, a little bit deeper into the psychological help you're talking about, Army, um, we have touched on it in previous weeks, but from your point of view, uh, is, do you know, are you aware of extra psychological help for Israeli citizens long term that has been put in place by the government themselves? Absolutely. There is a huge mobilization of, of psychologists all over the country uh, and um, and trying to make it accessible to civilians more easily and actually fund it. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm aware, being in, in these networks as a psychologist, there are many, many uh, applicants. <laughs> and what we learned in, uh, from our experience following Yom Kippur War, the sooner you treat these patients, these individuals, you avoid a more chronic state of uh, PTSD. I mean, one of them, I mean, I don't know if you remember, but in uh, up to Yom Kippur, Israeli soldiers were immune, were very strong. They would not uh, develop a post-traumatic reaction. But Yom Kippur war arrived and we realized that we are human beings and, and soldiers even very brave soldiers develop PTSD. And, but those days they didn't know, I remember it. I was a combat medic and, and individuals that started to show symptoms of PTSD were sent home, simply as that. Go back to your mom. I mean, you, you'll feel better then. And what we found that those that were sent home, <clears throat> those were the cases, those were the individuals who developed the most severe PTSD. And the strategy today uh, in the army, but it's a, it's a common uh, thing among psychologists to treat post-trauma as immediate as possible. And even not to release them from the units, to keep them at the unit, let them adjust, give them a few days to relax and go back to, to the combat, to the front line. And because if you uh, if you send them back home, that will incubate and become a more chronic uh, disorder, which is very very difficult to 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 cure or to handle. And presumably, there they'd also have a feeling of failure that they hadn't been able to continue with their. Yeah, sure, sure, but but uh, yeah. So we know it. We know it. Uh, that we need so so Israel fortunately uh, it took um, two three months to realize the extent of of the the of the phenomena and started to really uh, allocate a lot of funds to to deal with civilians and of course uh, with soldiers as well. So. So looking forward, as much as one can at all, as you say, we don't know whether the North's going to become more active and whether we don't know what's happening next. But can you well, see some positive opportunities coming out of this? Sorry um, to put you on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's difficult being in the midst of all of this and thinking of a positive outcome, you know, after what we experienced. Of 
Yeah, and having all these uh, kidnapped uh, 134 individuals in Gaza, children, babies, uh, women. Uh, but I think, yes, I think, first of all, um, it's a waking call for the army and for politicians that thought that by uh, feeding the beast, feeding Hamas and uh, buying time, buying quiet, uh, that, that's a solution. I mean, we realize now that we need uh, to destroy Hamas. I mean, there's no, uh, really no other way because look at the funds, billions of dollars that they invested instead of building houses for their poor people, feeding them, they built hundreds, between 500 to 700 kilometers of tunnels. Would you imagine? Seven, 500 to 700 kilometers and ammunition instead of feeding their people. So that have, must stop, must stop. And, uh, and hopefully, hopefully, will have a different uh, regime there. And my hope is that if the Palestinian Authority would change its attitude and stop teaching uh, there in schools using textbook uh, of hatred against Israel and try maybe to collaborate more with Israel. I I'm not saying that we, we didn't make mistakes in the past, we did. But I think now we all realize that we need uh, to do something different. So hopefully uh, we'll stop uh, what's going on in, in, in Gaza. I mean, we definitely, uh, ha Hamas will not go back to a leadership position. Um, that caused us also a positive thing in uh, that, that, thank God, that, that Hezbollah did not uh, attack us at the same day in the north, that would have been a real, real challenge um, because they are much more powerful than the Hamas. But the situation now is forcing us uh, to solve the situation in, in the northern border. I mean, uh, we're trying uh, to do it diplomatically, but if it won't happen diplomatically, we won't have any other solution, but maybe to have a limited war to uh, to actually I'll expect them to fulfill a, a UN resolution to be, a, they should have been 30 kilometers from the border. But now we're asking at least 10 kilometers. So I think Israel would ins insist on that. And uh, in terms of internal implications, I think um we we are ma now much less naive um and and again i am trying to avoid expressing my personal political uh, views but i think it's a time to have a a a different leadership um that that um, had in mind the needs of the people and uh, try to to really be more flexible in terms of uh, what to compromise on. I mean, I think these extremists, in two ends, by the way, are, are just causing damage. We must realize that we need to make some compromises to live in peace. And hopefully we will achieve that. I mean, actually, uh, some, uh, we, some of the... Uh, explanations why Hamas attacked us these days is exactly because they saw that maybe Saudi Arabia are going to, to sign a peace treaty with Israel. And then, uh, and uh, so in a way they wanted to reshuffle the, the cards again. But hopefully with, uh, with uh, a peace treaty with Saudi Arabia, with the Emirates and other uh, moderate uh, Arab countries, we're going to change the political, uh, geopolitical situation in the area. Thank you. I'm not sure how optimistic we can be, but it's good to ha have some optimism to look forward to. It's uh, still very difficult times, and we really appreciate you giving us 
your your thoughts and um on, on the psychological side and the the trauma that's being dealt with all around is is one we've been aware of since i guess november once the, the, we've moved so thank you so much for joining us this thank morning. you really thank really you really thank you it was a pleasure best Thank you all, um, audience, for joining us and I look forward to seeing you next week where we have da David Hazoni joining us, who uh, has just written the Jewish, put together the Jewish Priorities book and will be in London in April. Um, Ellie, look forward to seeing you soon. Let's hope the news is better by the time we meet. Thank you. Thank Shabbat you. Shalom, everyone. Sh Shabbat Thank shalom. Bye-bye.